Oh, we almost didn't record video, and that How would have fun. been very, very silly. That was well, we've done it before, and I'm sure we'll do it again. It's not the first time. Uh, people don't seem happy when it happens, so I'll yeah. try to keep us on the camera. <laughs> Thank God. Okay, well, hi, Christine. How are you? Hello, Em. I'm doing splendidly. How are you doing? I'm good. You seem a little sleepy. Are you a little sleepy? Uh, I'm kind of always a little sleepy. I changed my antidepressant dosage so i'm oh. kind of struggling <laughs> interesting I, what's the dealio with that and being pregnant are they is well, that like a are they worried very about controversial that so i try to uh keep keep it keep it on the dl but you know here we are um but your doctor said it was okay yes 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 so yes, there yes. You have it. people have very strong opinions but everything seems fine for now and Baby's Look, just fine. because you're pregnant doesn't mean depression ended. So you still got to gotta figure yeah, it out for yourself. Yeah, I had a not so great appointment with somebody. I'm not going to mention where I was or whatever, but she told me maybe I should consider praying. And oh, I was like, well, I was wow. about to say for God's sake. That's but, you know. <laughs> cool. No, thank you. Um, huh. So okay. she was very, it was not a comfortable experience. So. But um, so anyway, that's why I'm a little sleepy, but I'm I'm here for you. And also, I wanted to point out before I forget that I was trying to come up with what to call my hair headband. Oh, yeah. I what feel you, really... call, you came up with a new phrase that I wanted to m remember. You said, oh, it's your trashy head, trashy garbage head wrap <laughs> or your garbage trash head wrap. <laughs> I so was that's trying to remember, even worse. I knew it had something. We called it like trashy. We or something. didn't call it anything. I did. <laughs> you but I don't did. remember what what we what the name is it we landed on classy trashy classy trash not that's garbage right. trash oh my god you made it so much worse today <laughs> uh, well in, in the in the midst of that sentence i was trying to compliment you and say your hair looks great but it's always in the midst of a compliment it always is you know if you ever by the way if you ever meet me in real life and i see something that's just like so off the cuff rude know that i was trying to compliment you <laughs> <laughs> Oh my god yeah uh, i was good at that so anyway i just wanted to remember that you called it garbage trash today so that's that's nice well i feel i have a hunch people are gonna hold that uh, i'm gonna remember now because <laughs> uh i'm sure i'll actually i'll probably forget and say something even meaner in a week you know about your oh, I dumpster know. fire head or something i, <laughs> I don't just want to remember i just want it to be recorded for posterity's sake you know uh, meanwhile christine complimented my hair which was an accident and you tried with your hair and so now i yeah, feel well i complimented bad. you with no qualms about it it was just a straightforward compliment i think you have less social anxiety than me today because uh, today it, maybe yeah. today yeah <laughs> oh well oops sorry about that uh <clears throat> uh well, why do you drink christine besides being uh, garbage <laughs> besides being a dumpster head um well, um, I guess it is because I'm changing my, do my, I'm trying to lower my dosages of my medications and it's. Um, oh, lower. Yes. And it's a daunting experience. Um, I thought you would be raising it because your <laughs> I'm weight. I'm so depressed. Well, because your weight, since you have a baby in you, like your weight is changing and therefore I would think your, your amount oh, would change. Oh, I don't know if they do it by weight. I don't oh. think they do dosage by weight, but. I don't know enough about medicine, <laughs> obviously, but, um, I mean, hmm. I've never been told that, but maybe, um, no, no, I'm, I'm just changing things around, just tweaking things. Um, but yeah, all good. Just a little sleepy. Um, but otherwise, you know, uh, clock is ticking. I think when this episode comes out, it'll be really, 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 really close to my due date. If not, well, I'll be there. white knuckling it. I'll be waiting Ooh. for a text every second. Oh my gosh, you'll be waiting for an aggressive FaceTime. Don't worry. I, I will say, Christine, yeah, if I don't get notified until after the baby oh, is come here, on. I will scream at your baby. Just I mean, here's so we're thing. clear. You'll scream at my baby. <laughs> wow, what a threat. Uh, although I will say, I feel like if I go into labor, like if I'm not doing the scheduled C-section, I go into labor, then it's unlikely that you won't hear about it because I'll be like in a hospital for two days or whatever before it actually happens. Or I'll be like, not two days, but I'll be like, 
If you're missing for two days and I don't get a single notification, I'll be like, Eva, <laughs> she's dead. <laughs> Eva, you've been her baby, promoted Eva, to on. co-host. <laughs> <laughs> that might happen either way. But um, yeah, don't worry. You'll hear about it ASAP. But um, anyway, why do you drink, Emothy? I don't know. Today's a little gloomy and I'm feeling the vibes. But I, I don't know. I feel like I have a lot of work I need to get done but i am currently in a brain fog where i don't remember what that work is i feel (laughs) so it's a fun feeling of guilt and uh and apprehension and nervousness because i'm like what what am i supposed to be doing well my fear is that if you have work to do that means i also have work to do so i'm like uh uh-oh the fear is like i don't know where it's i honestly it's probably like me like I see the weather outside and it's gloomy and I just want to like relax all day. And I think my brain is telling me, Oh, oh, oh before you get really excited, is there anything you need to do? And now I'm right. panicking that I can't think of anything. You're getting that capitalism guilt. Yeah. yeah. You get it. You Have get fun. it. Oh, well, we're anyway. working right now. So this is enough for you to, I would say, check a, check it off your list. I did see a pretty interesting t-shirt at Target that I might treat myself to after this. What is so it? An interesting t-shirt. By interesting, it's really nothing that special. But it was purple, and I'm interested, so <laughs> that makes it interesting. <laughs> okay, cool. <laughs> uh, Old Navy has this um, gender-neutral line, which I, by the way, shout out to Old Navy. I should really be promoting them more often because half of my clothing no, is no, from there no. now. No, no, no. Stop. You keep promoting companies, and then we don't get paid for it. Okay, 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 okay. But Target, if you would like to be, <laughs> if you would like to work with us, uh, they have a few shirts that are looking more and more gender neutral, and I think it's intentional. So I wonder if they're gonna like say well, that there's Target a line was the coming. One that switched to to kids' toys rather than boys mm-hmm. and girls' toys. They were like one of the first big companies to do that. So wouldn't be yeah. surprising. I wouldn't be surprised. They're always moving and grooving. So anyway, I, I saw the shirt and I went, "Ooh, that looks pretty fun." Is it so, tie dye? No, it's literally just purple, but it's got, like, black sleeves. I don't know what to tell you. Oh, it's wow. really not that special that to anyone thrilling. else. But I'm very, if you see me in a purple shirt with black sleeves, you'll know I had a good day today. If I FaceTime you and I'm in the hospital birthing a child and you don't answer, <laughs> my head is immediately going to go, wow, Em's at Target shopping for a purple t-shirt and can't bother to hear about my unborn <laughs> child coming into the world. Yeah, that might be the case. We'll find yeah. out. Okay, so Christine, I actually have a quick story for you today, but it's a very fun story full of potential banter and whimsy. Ooh. So you know, everyone I love... is rolling their eyes. I can't wait. I know. Well, I love a good whimsical tale. So here we go. This is the story of Rudolph Fence. Have you heard of Rudolph? No. Fence, fence not like a fe- like sitting on the fence. Fence like E N T Z. Oh, fun that fact. sounds German. Yeah. Uh, so Rudolf Fentz, uh, this is a story about a time traveler. <gasps> is he German? Uh, the jury's out. Oh. I don't know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, we can make him German. Sounds pretty German, I don't right? want to make any calls about people's ethnicity and background, <clears throat> so. He is um, a man, is all, I, is okay. all I've got. Um, okay, so fun facts about uh, time travel really quick, because I had to throw some in there, obviously. Um, and I did not bring up any Back to the Future things because I thought that might be overdone. So these are other time travel facts. Okay, this is interesting because I think I've probably heard all the Back to the Future ones already from you. Yeah, this I probably wiped the slate clean too, <laughs> just so you could be prepared to hear them again one day because I never <laughs> shut up about it. Okay, so in 2015, CBS News did a poll of if you were to uh, travel through time, what would you bring with you? Do you know <gasps> what the most common answer was? My iPhone was probably everyone's answer. No, no one brought an iPhone. What? <laughs> Which is so weird because that would be the first thing I'd do. Yeah. Uh, a fully charged iPhone. Um, okay. <laughs> what about a camera? I don't know. God, that's so smart. No. I guess the iPhone would have the camera, but. Well, I'll give you a hint. I'll give you a hint. That doctor who told you to pray would bring this thing. A Bible? 41% of people no, said they didn't. a Bible. Yeah. Excuse me? Why? I, don't have that answer for I you hope they mean the Bible where it's cut out in the middle and there's actually like, it's like <laughs> a, a flask. Safe. Yeah, there's a flask in it. Uh, well, I only say that because I have a Bible with a flask cut out in it. So, when you um, don't even drink and you're not, okay, it's, whatever. You know what? It's a little, it's a fun surprise for the people snooping through my bookshelf. All you right? know, I have one of those that's a Nancy Reagan uh, memoir, but actually, if you open it, it's like a safe. 
I have that. Did you get it from the DC Spy Museum? Um, probably. <laughs> because that's where I got mine. It's from Jor- uh, George Vidal or something. And it's like a book on politics. That's and probably where I got it. Yeah. Uh, it's like one of the most innocuous looking book covers ever. It's just like. Yeah. It's like boring and blends in and all that. White lady on the front. Um, but now that if anybody breaks in my house, they know where my flask is. <laughs> Find the book with the white lady on it. Um <laughs> No, it's so a Bible, apparently, 41%. That is absurd. <clears throat> what is wrong with you people? And then uh, 31% said, I guess this makes more sense, antibiotics. Yeah, okay, that that I can get behind. That tracks, that tracks. Because, like, that makes some logical sense. A Bible, like... What are you going to do with that? I'll yeah, see what if you can find a Bible literally at any exactly point in time. It. Like, depending on when you're going. Obviously, so if you're going stupid. back to the dinosaurs, okay, maybe not. But, like, what are you going to do with a Bible back then? What, are you going to throw it at a dinosaur? I don't I know. I mean, like, maybe. <laughs> or maybe bring one to Jesus and be like, look what they said about you. Like, you that know? I get. If you were, like, very specifically like, can, a plan Can for you Bible, fact check this real quick? Here's a pen. Can you? Oh, by the way, this is what a pen looks like. They're going to be big. You'll, you'll see. <laughs> yeah. Were there actually unicorns back then? Or is this a mistranslation? Like, I do have a lot of questions, you know, uh, but... 21% of people, uh, do you want to take a, a stab at this? or you, So wait, maybe, so we got Bible antibiotics. Yeah. And by take a stab, I mean maybe do you want to take a shot at it? A gun. Yep. 21%. Yep. Not surprised. So, oh my God, this is so embarrassing. So they want to bring a fucking gun a Bible and, and a Bible. Gun. I and wanna, maybe I just, Trump with them? I don't know. I don't I'm understand. Just, like so embarrassed right now. Okay. Um. So... At least uh, a gun serves a purpose, right? Like a gun serves a purpose, yeah. Because like, if you are going back to dinosaur era, you know. Yeah. But then, are you like trying to poach dinosaurs? Like, what's happening here? Well, I assume if wherever you're going, you're you at least have a weapon, like to defend yourself. If people are like, "What are these blue jeans you're wearing?" You know, then you can defend <laughs> yourself. <laughs> I really hope the people who want to bring a gun, though, aren't the people going into the future because then it's oh, like God. something as simple as a phone could scare the shit out of you and you feel the need to protect yourself. And I don't know. Uh, I don't know. Three uh, percent. I don't know what I do know what these people have planned and I don't like it. Three um, percent are condoms. They would bring condoms oh, before anything else. Oh, for God's sake. So, oh like, God, I don't know. I'm so embarrassed I feel right like now. That, that comes with an intention. Like, you have a, a particular interest in a particular person, and you think you're going to be the one to blow them away. So, like, if you get captured by the government, because obviously you look suspicious in your Levi's, and they're like, "What's what are you wearing uh -huh. you're in the year 1565? So then they capture you, <laughs> and you have a literal Bible and condoms on you. Like, what do you think is going to happen? Which, this by is the so way, embarrassing. A condoms and a bible that tells you to procreate do not mix my friends no that's so the other thing yeah who, i who don't are understand these people? um so three percent condoms that does freak me out that makes me worried about the people that agreed you are trying to travel to see because you're definitely going to pull some sort of like i'm from the future shit to impress them and like get them in bed so i guess at least you don't want to procreate with them i guess <clears throat> i guess yeah that's at least smart at least they know enough about the butterfly effect you can't you don't right. want to give them a Create baby. a new generation with no side effects. <laughs> Another 3% are people like me, and they said that they would bring Christopher Lloyd, who played Dr. Emmett Brown from Back to the Future. Are you for real? I'm not kidding. But they, also... They said they would bring a fictional character. They would No, they time. would bring the actor who played a fictional oh, character. The actor. Which is Which is even dumber, because, like, that man cannot actually... I don't know if they need to hear this, but, like, he doesn't actually know about time travel. No, I'm bringing Stephen Hawking. Like, what are you doing bringing an <laughs> right. actor? If you're bringing someone, bring, like, Carl Sagan. Like, what's yeah, wrong with precisely. you? Yeah, precisely. So, um, yeah, a Bible, antibiotics, a gun, condoms, Christopher Lloyd. So there you have it. I think they got mixed up and thought, heard, like, what's in your purse right now? And they were like, oh, let me check. <laughs> Because this is like bizarre. Christopher Lloyd is just like a little, you know, <laughs> taking out my wallet. He's a, he's a borrower. Um, okay, so uh, this year, CBS did a new uh, poll, which wasn't as uh, detailed, but it just said, if you could go, if you could time travel, where would you go, past or future? What do you think the percentage of either one is? Mm -hmm. Who would so go the, those are the two options, past or future. Mm -hmm. I would say 60% want to go to the past. Okay. And 40% want to go to the future. Interesting. 40% said the past. Oh, okay. And Which, uh, I don't know how I feel about that. I guess. I don't either. I, what would you do? Um, Forever ago, I would have said the past because I like to cherry pick the things I would like to experience from the past. Right, same. Uh, but I think the future, there's 
a safer, more progress. I fingers crossed it's a more progressive world. So that would be fun to see like where we're heading. And also I could get a sneak peek of technology. And also I think there's a less of a chance that I'd fuck up the butterfly effect. Oh, good point. But I guess my fear about the future is like, oh my God, what if it's a fucking apocalypse is how I imagine the future. And then, then like, I can uh-oh. prepare better, I guess. I, I feel like if you go into the future, like no matter what, you at least come back with knowledge. Yeah, but right? what if the knowledge is like I now have a mental breakdown because I know that everybody's dead and I don't know. I have and no there's idea. there's been a nuclear <laughs> war. I don't know. I feel like the past at least I can be like, I'm just going to go to the 60s and sit on the sidelines and watch a Yeah, it would. if parade. I were to go to the past <laughs> nowadays, I would have to go back to like a really monumental time and like help protest. But like I also... I, I don't think I could go back the way that I used to think of it of like, oh, I just want to go to the 50s and drink a milkshake at the diner. And it's oh, like, no, that wouldn't work. <laughs> I know. I used to think that way and I hate myself for it. But now I, I think I think I'd pick future. I think I'd pick future now. Huh. I don't know. And anyway, by the way, it was 40 percent past and 53 percent the future and 7 percent were unsure. So okay, if you fall into I'm that, you're not alone. Unsure. So, uh there is, I've mentioned this before when I mentioned um, Project Pegasus, which, by the way, shout out episodes 102 and 103. When you mentioned Project Pegasus, no, you like did a full when I, deep dive. When I gave a sermon about it, actually. <laughs> um, I've said in the past there are some uh, pictures that are historical pictures that have not been doctored, and there's something very fishy about I them. I love and those photos. It looks like someone from the future is there. It makes no fucking sense. So cool. So uh, I just wanted to give a shout out to some of those pictures again. Some of them I talk about during the Project Pegasus episodes. One of them was the little boy who looked like he was like wearing 80s clothing at like the Gettysburg address or something. Ah. Like there was the there's that really famous one of a guy who looks like he's in a crowd of people dressed in like 1940s clothing, but he's wearing like crazy like steampunk goggles and a T-shirt, like a band T-shirt. OK, but like what are they thinking? Like they nobody was like, what are you wearing, guy? I have no idea. That's a I I don't know. It's and they to this day haven't really been fully explained, which is so wild to me. There's so also creepy. There's also a painting from 1860 that actually threw people for a loop because technology has changed. So there's a painting from 1860 called The Expected One. And it looks, it literally looks like a girl from the 1860s is like staring at an iPhone. Wait, can I look at it? Yeah, it's called The Expected One. 1860. Expected or expectant? The Expected One. The Expected One painting. Oh my God. She looks like she's like walking and like texting or something. Ew, ew, I just got goose cam. It really Isn't it does. Creepy? Yeah. So apparently it did get debunked and she's holding a prayer book and like walking to church in the a painting. Prayer book, wink. Uh-huh, 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 uh-huh. It's got a uh. flask in it. Um <laughs> it's Nancy Reagan's <laughs> memoir. <laughs> <laughs> but so uh it's just it's interesting to even think about how new conspiracy theories can come out of new technology when looking That's at old art. Because you're like, oh, why does this look like she's... How come no one's yeah. ever mentioned before that she's a time traveler? But you have like it's a new because... perspective. You wouldn't have thought about this before an iPhone existed. So what was the one... Can I look at... Sorry, now I'm being just derailing. Yeah. But can I look at the pictures that you mentioned earlier? It's the guy... Uh, the... I don't know the name of it, but if you type in a nine. 1940s picture guy in sunglasses you'll see it okay i typed in it's pretty famous oh my god okay so i typed in time travel photos 1940 holy crap we could put these on our instagram as well by the way yeah we should he's literally wearing yeah like a t-shirt and like goggles sunglasses sunglasses, yeah and it's he looks like he's like waiting for a band to start it's like wow (laughs) but it's just so weird that like how come nobody at the time that picture was taken even thought he looked out of place? Maybe they did. And they just were like, well. They're like, here's a weirdo just what hanging is, out. Look at this weirdo. Right. It could be. <laughs> but so then also, let's, pre- let's pretend it's a. Oh, and then there's the little kid and the kids um, from the Gettysburg address. Oh, I think okay. that was actu- act like that's claimed to be Andrew Basiago, the guy who's like the one oh, talk- right. who's like whistleblowing Project Pegasus. He claims to be the Gettysburg address kid. Oh, my God. Yeah. Um, and so I also wonder if that is based on time travel. Let's say they really are time travelers. Why didn't anyone warn those people about like, hey, there's going to be one camera that exists in this decade. Don't yeah. stand in front of it. Like, <laughs> It seems like you would, the odds of you getting captured on camera would be really slim. And yet they're finding ways to do it. Huh. 
So interesting, uh, interesting. Anyway, just wanted to give a shout out to some time travel so art, if you will. Creepy. Um. So yeah. So okay. So here's the story of Rudolph Fence. So the story is in 1950, in June 1950, and at a it's in New York City. So at about 11:15 at night, an anonymous witness says that they just they write to the police. They say. They write to the police. It really is the 50s, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> they snail mail the police. Uh, they reported that they saw a man who looked like he was in his early 30s just magically appear in Times Square. Wow. Just magically appear. And this guy is in old-fashioned clothing. He literally has, like, checkerboard pants. Like, he's got uh, probably, like, a bowler hat and, like, a thick wool jacket. Like, he's looks like he's not... From the 50s. Okay. Oh, so they think he's <laughs> earlier than the 50s. Yeah. He looks gotcha. like he's in, even in 1950, he was reported as having very old fashioned clothing. He had mutton chops and his Whoa. facial hair apparently matched the time of the 1870s. Whoa. Which like, by the way, if you think about the 1870s, that was only 80 years before 1950. So in theory, people in 1950 could like match that very clearly of like, oh, that's an 1870s facial right, hair. Because now we would understand what that's about 70 years before us now. The fifties. Yeah. So yeah, we could be exactly. Like, oh, that's what the fifties looked like. That's what we wore in the fifties. Blows my mind because when I think of the fifties, I can like very quickly come to an idea. But when yeah. I you say eighteen seventies, I'm like, what do you who do you that think I am? A historian? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Facial so anyway. hair of the 70, 1870s? Yeah. So anyway, fr- if you were from the fifties, uh, you could very clearly pick out an eighteen seventies facial hair yeah. uh, style. So they said, yeah, old-fashioned clothes, checkered pants, uh, mutton chops, 1870s facial hair. And apparently he just seemed amazed at the <gasps> sight of New York City. Oh, and like, he was in Central – or where was he not Central He Park? was in Times the Square. center of Times Square, yeah. Wow. Um, apparently he was, quote, gawking at the signs as if he'd never seen an electric sign before. That's so cool. Which, like, okay, pretend this is real for a second, though. Like, I'm like I'm assuming this is not real. Pretend that, like, there really is a time traveler who can show up to the middle of Times Square. And, like, you've never seen, like, a neon light before or, like, You're a You're pretending billboard. this. You just threw me more by saying I don't, I'm assuming this is not real. M saying that about their own story is just really It's time travel. I'm pretty – I'm, like, going to take a stab and assume it's not real. What? Like, I'm I thought you believe in time travel. This one doesn't have enough information to back it up for me. Really? Yeah. Uh-huh. But – I'm going to assume till the bitter end that this is true. I'm assuming it's real until proven otherwise. So we're switching places today. Fun. I love when we roll reverse. So, uh, but imagine like you've our never listeners s- need someone to be like, you know, convinced oh, this is real. Team time travel. I know. I know. I know. I know. I'm very out of my element today. You. So, uh, but imagine for the, you've never seen neon or an, an electric sign before. Right. I, mean, I would be. I would imagine it was like uh, the first time you and I experienced that the VR goggles. Like, <laughs> right? I to this, I I remember that was the only time I've ever truly jaw dropped. I was amazed. I felt like my par- my grandparents, the first time they saw like a TV show with color. I was like, yeah, <laughs> I was like, yeah. what is going on? But the crazy thing is that with a like an electric light, like you wouldn't even know how to process it. Well, no, but you wouldn't even know what to expect like with vr at least we had an idea of like oh it's sort of like a tv but you feel like you're in it like i feel like mm-hmm. we at least had a grasp on it but with something that hadn't been invented yet like a neon sign like how do you even yeah. grasp like you're gonna see a neon sign you wouldn't even know how to imagine if you that. were like like a horse and wagon hadn't even been created as a concept yet and all of a sudden you time travel <laughs> to a place where there's like motorcycles like can you yeah. imagine i would poop my pants at every second of the time <laughs> That's i was why there i'm scared of the future i'm like i'm just gonna go to the past it's where i can feel comfortable i think i would have to go to like a, like the near future like i'd like to see what my grandkids are up to like okay. and that's about as well, far as my we other can fear get. about the future is very black mirror of like what if we have mind reading by then and people are like <sighs> read my mind i don't know i feel like i just i feel too i'd have to do it in like increments of like five years to warm myself up i think Ugh, i don't want to if know. i had that option so okay so he looks just beyond overwhelmed at times square and all of a sudden something seems to startle him we don't know what it is but something scares him and he just takes off and starts running oh god and he's so overwhelmed by the city doesn't totally know where he's running to and he gets hit by a cab oh no and he dies. 
Oh, shit. Oh, well, he really messed this one up. <laughs> he, that Talk about a butterfly effect. Now Rudy, there's a whole story, uh, and now geez. I'm doing a podcast on it. I mean, Rudolph was not careful. Rudy. Um, <clears throat> so the police show up. And a crowd is gathering around him. They're like, who the heck is this guy? Why does he look so out of place? Then again, like, it's New York City. I feel like it, this is not that far-fetched so far. To find, of, like, like, your grandparents' old bowler hat. and Yeah. Wear, yeah, yeah. I don't know why people were so shocked at this point. But apparently, they the thing that got really suspicious was nobody knew who he was. So, like, you, they had to take him to the coroner's office or the morgue. And they had to go digging through his pockets to be able to identify him. And they found some really odd shit in his pockets. <gasps> so you would not be able to guess what yeah, these things are. But a would Bible you like and some condoms? I was going to ask. <laughs> Can you imagine if it was actually all the things that tw- 2015 CBS News predicted? I know exactly Christopher what Lloyd it is. is in his shoe. And <laughs> Christopher Lloyd, <laughs> <laughs> just great, Scott. Um, okay, so. The first and most important thing is that they found business cards in his pocket, multiple, which made them think it was his name. Otherwise, he just had, like, one that he could have grabbed from somebody. Yeah. But he had a bunch at the ready. So, and the name on it was Rudolph Fence. So, okay. they they assume that's his name. They also found uh, $70 worth of 19th century banknotes. It's 1800 mm. money. Uh, they had, they found other business cards for Rudolph that were actually addressed to, um, Fifth Avenue in New York. Uh, there was a letter that was delivered to the same Fifth Avenue address. Uh, and the letter was sent from Philadelphia in 1876, which was how many years, 74 years earlier. So there's a letter from 74 years ago to his address. Weird. There's a five cent brass and copper token for beer with the name of an unknown saloon on it. Wow. That when they went to investigate the saloon, nobody had heard of it. Uh, There was a receipt from a barn on Lexington Avenue for a horse and carriage washing, which after doing investigation, the, a barn at that address had not existed. Wow. And a medal for a three legged race. (laughs) Good job. He, that was important. That was just as important as that all the one, other items to him. That one he was clinging on to for the yeah. until he until his last. That breath. was inside the Nancy Reagan memoir safe. It was yeah. like, this is my special <laughs> special item. He was like nobody needs Don't to touch, touch this. this as badly as I do. So uh, they were like, "Who the fuck is Rudolph Fence at Fifth Ave? And why does he have shit from the 1800s and also Only. a medal from like nothing current? It sounds like nothing current. Yeah, uh, yeah. So it was." 1800s money, a business card to an address, the 74-year-old letter, a five-cent beer token for an unknown saloon, the receipt wow. at an address that didn't exist, and the medal. So um, they found out his name, but the, he didn't live at that address, and so he ended up becoming a missing persons case. Wow. And this is so cool. So at the missing persons bureau department. I don't know what they called it in the 1950s, but um, the guy who took up his case was Captain Hubert Rim. And Captain Rim really only had that address to go off of and his name. Uh, but the man wasn't listed anywhere in prior documents. He, his prints weren't on record. Um, so he goes to the Fifth Avenue address and it was not actually a house, but it was a storefront and the owner had never heard of a Rudolph fence. So dead end. That's so creepy. Dead end. So he later decides, he's like, you know what? Maybe he actually lived in a different, he lived there at a different time. So maybe I just have to go through every individual phone book and just find this fucking guy. Wow. And he ended up finding a Rudolph Fence Jr. (gasps) in a a phone book from 1939. So 11 (gasps) years prior. Wow. Wow. And he went to the apartment uh, from and the address from that phone book, and the neighbor remembered there being a Rudolph Fence Jr. So this guy who just showed up in 1950, he's in his early 30s. His son lived there 11 years earlier. So wow, that's already okay. creepy. Yes, like it is. You're like what our age, and you have an adult son that lives somewhere. And so the neighbor says that Rudolph Fence Jr was a few decades ago in his 60s. 
And oh, wait, so that, I never heard how old the current Rudolph guy is who died. Yeah, so so the guy, who, whoever reported him as like what he was wearing and all that said he was in his early 30s. Oh, got it. Okay, okay. So then they're <clears throat> saying now his potential son was in his 60s a few decades ago? Yeah. Holy shit. Okay. Wow. And apparently in 1940, which was 10 years earlier to when this is happening, they said like, oh, 10 years ago, Rudolph Fence Jr. moved to a retirement home. Oh my God, how creepy is that? So Captain Brim got a hold of the local bank in the neighborhood thinking like, oh, if he lived here, they might have a file on him. Right. And they found a former account at the bank with Rudolph Fence Jr., and they said, unfortunately, we can't contact him for you because Rudolph Fence Jr. died five years ago. <gasps> but his wife still lives in Florida. Oh, my God. So Captain Rim finds the wife in Florida. And when he said, like, look, there's this guy named Rudolph Fence. Uh, he looks like this. He just showed up in Times Square. And basically, she was blown away because <gasps> apparently... Uh, in 1876, the time of the letter and the time of the, the that the beer token would have been around and the receipt for the barn, apparently in 1876, 74 years ago, her father-in-law, Rudolph Fence Sr., who was 29 at the time, he decided to go for a walk after dinner one night and completely vanished and was no. never heard from again. no. So and it was all the way down to the exact clothing description, the same age description, and the it was the year, the year eighteen seventy six, and it was around the same time because I think he showed up at eleven o'clock at night in nineteen fifty. But why don't you believe he, this is real? I'm fully convinced already. When I love he this. when he disappeared in eighteen seventy six, it was ten o'clock at night, and he showed up an hour later in nineteen fifty. That is isn't that crazy? So creepy. So. It was like, yeah, he's just been missing for 74 years and he showed up at the exact same age in the exact same clothing in the exact same spot that he would have been walking. I'm just, that's Goose Cam Central. It, so a lot of people think maybe it's just a ghost. Maybe they just saw something. But there was also witnesses. This guy's doing a literal investigation on this body yeah. that is in a morgue. Yeah. Like they have all his items. Like it's like yeah. in hand. Yeah. So he, you know, you cross ghost off the list. So yeah. uh, there was actually, after all of this, as creepy as it was, there was never an official report filed on Rudolph Fence because apparently time travel was not a good enough explanation for all of this. So it's still an open <laughs> case. So, so but, but it's like, it's real, right? Like there's actually a case on this. Yeah. So Cap Ca Captain. Hubert Rim. Yeah, mm -hmm. he was in charge of the investigation, wow. but there's no official report filed with like a like a cause of like oh, what I happened see. to this guy. Okay. So how did a 30 year old man vanish or 29 year old man vanish in 1876 and suddenly appear almost 75 years later at the exact same age in the exact same outfit? So in 1972, this is 22 years after Rudolph Fence was seen again. Uh, in 1972, there was a supernatural investigation group uh, called, and that's why we drank, just kidding. It's called. Oh, I literally uh, almost said that, and then you said it, and I was like, whoa, this is really crazy. tripping me out. Oh my God. It's called Borderland Sciences Research Foundation. Sounds way more professional than, and that's why it we drink. <laughs> absolutely does. And apparently, uh, they their belief is that Fence could have just walked through a time portal by accident. Um, allegedly Rudolph might have quote slipped through a hole in the fabric of reality between our dimension and the fourth dimension. Sure, 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 sure. And the article I read on this was a lot more, um, sciencey. They gave like at least two or three paragraphs trying to describe this concept, but just for us to be able to swallow the pill, uh, our dimension, the fourth dimension, there can be like thin little pockets and you can fall into the thin pockets and show up somewhere else. Theoretically, at least. Theoretically. Yeah. So they think that he was just walking in a, like a liminal space and kind of fell through and How popped scary. out on the other end. Yeah. And that would explain, I mean, if he's going for like a, an evening night stroll after dinner and all of a sudden he sees electric neon signs and cars everywhere, he's no probably wonder. freaking out. Because my thought was, oh, well, if he planned this, he really should have been prepared for like not expect, you know, for being yeah. startled. But I guess if you were just casually taking a walk and all of a sudden it was like, buy the new iPhone. Like, oh, my God, <laughs> you'd be so scared. Look, this is why I don't go for walks. OK, you don't know what's going to happen. That's exactly why I don't leave my house. Also agreed. Same. 
thing. And so that was kind of the end that we heard of it for a while. But then the internet came about and this story regained this like surge of popularity Mm -hmm. because it's like spread across the cybersphere. And uh, in the year 2000, there was an article in a magazine called Masala. Uh, It's a Spanish magazine. And I don't know. Mas Aya, I don't know how to how I would pronounce it, but M A S and then A L L A. So Mas Aya. That's how I would guess it. Yeah. Okay. So they did an article in their magazine about Rudolph Fence, and one like uh, supernatural researcher named Chris Aubeck, mm-hmm. he saw the article and ended up publishing his own two years later after doing his own like investigative. A recon on where the story must have come from or how why haven't we heard about it in a while where like what's going on okay so he claims that rudolph fence is not a real story he claims that it's inspired by the 1953 short story called a voice from the gallery by ralph holland oh through over time we ended up finding out that that story a voice from the gallery by ralph holland was inspired by another story called I'm Scared by Jack Finney, who later wrote The Body Snatchers, fun fact. Oh. Which, which would then become the Invasion of the Body Snatchers movie. So Chris Aubeck says, this story doesn't exist. It's just been told a million times and originally comes from I'm Scared by Jack Finney. Okay. And I'm Scared was Me first... Pu- <laughs> <laughs> I'm Scared was first published in... I never learned how to say it. Collier's Magazine? Collier's magazine. I think it's Collier. Yeah. Collier's. Okay. Um, it was first published in the September 1951 issue, Uh, AKA a a year after this story was said to have happened. uh So it could have been that. And by the way, Collier's was like a well-respected magazine at the time. So it could have been one of those like war of the worlds on the radio things where people were listening to war of the worlds and people freaked the fuck out because they thought it was legit it was fiction right they could have read this night this story from the 1951 issue of colliers which was people trusted and it says like oh a year ago this guy just showed up I in Nor- new york city and people all freaked out that a time traveler showed up a year ago how like close to the story was the magazine article Christine, it was pretty identical. Oh. Like, super duper, holy crap, I knew identical. You do this to me. So, I'm Scared by Jack Finney was apparently a collection of fake stories, which were being written as if they were true. It was a collection of stories of people's experiences time traveling. I see. And one of the stories, I think the, the last story of the collection was actually Rudolph Fence's story. Oh. <laughs> All the way down to Captain Hubert Rim being the one that was the detective on the case. <laughs> oh, no. It also said... Was the said, name Ru- Rudolph... Yeah. Fence? Oh, yeah. fuck. Okay. <laughs> Damn it. So, so this was... It, since the story was based in 1950 and this magazine came out in 1951, it's very easy to be like, oh, yeah, a year ago, I'm Rudolph Fence and I wrote in and a year ago, you know, I time traveled too. It's crazy. I don't, no. I don't really... I didn't read I'm Scared, but I'm assuming it's something along those lines. Um, and it actually did suggest that people, uh, the reason all these people were able to write in as their experiences with time travel, the reason people were now time traveling so frequently is because people were trying to escape what was going on in the world so desperately that they were quote, disturbing the clock of time and time itself was breaking down. Oh my God. And so they were able to find all these little pockets of time portals. And that was what was causing all these people who wrote in to be able to time travel. So, uh, from I'm scared and Collier's this Rudolph fence story got mentioned again later uh, in 1972 by the Borderland Sciences Research Foundation. It, they were the ones that brought it up again uh, in their own journal. Uh, and rumor has it, so let's do the timeline here. So in 1951, Jack Finney writes, I'm scared, mm-hmm. where the story literally comes from. Then there's discussion that uh, Ralph Holland, this other author, Two years after the Collier's uh, story comes out, he basically rips off the story to a, nearly a T. Oh, great. In this short story called A Voice from the Gallery, which is what 
that guy in the year 2000 found and was saying like, oh, I think the story was inspired by this. Gotcha. The same guy who wrote that short story was actually a member of the Borderland Sciences Research Foundation, which would explain why they did their own story about it in the 70s. Oh. So it all kind of is jumbled together. But basically, this all at a very beginning stemmed from I'm Scared by Jack Finney. And <laughs> okay. uh, so basically, when Rudolph Fence, when this story was mentioned in Collier's, it was implied to be true, leading to its like heightened creep factor and people starting to bring it up in the in the future. And the original article um, from 1951 from the Collier's uh, magazine, it now actually has a section afterwards that explains the truth behind it. Oh, okay. Um, there is also like this like random plot twist that in 2007, one researcher at a news archive found uh the same story of rudolph fence before collier's was even published and so it was implying that like oh so that like if i'm scared is the first place to have written about it but this story actually happened five months earlier then maybe there really was a time traveler mm -hmm. it became this whole random twist where they really wanted time travel to sound like it could have happened but yeah. really it was probably fake so Aww. anyway this all stems from a 1951 article in collier's magazine but enough people truly believed it was legitimate for a while, especially when the internet came out. And anyway, that's the story of Rudolph. Fence. Oh my God. I mean, it's a great story. Like I understand why people like got sucked into it. And it's especially with all the details of like, Oh, and this was in his pockets. And then his, these are what he's wearing. And, and we found his wife in Florida. I mean, yeah. come on. Anyway, uh, there you have it. I am looking, I've just typed him in here. Ew, so creepy. Yeah, the first thing, of course, is a Snopes article. Uh, yeah, well, there you have it. I feel Aww. like they, um, there's also, if you look up Rudolph Fence, there's like an actual picture that shows up of a guy. So like yeah, that implies to him. be him with to, like his his mustache. His mustache. And all that. <laughs> Which is so funny because if you, if you just Google the name Rudolph Fence, the first thing that shows up is Rudolph Fence, fictional character. I know. Bummer, man. Yeah. Oh, well. Oh, it's a well. great story, though. It's very creepy. I thought so. I love it. Uh, well, now that makes sense why. Because I was like, M is saying it might not be real. Yeah, I, I almost, I caught myself in a stumble there. Oh, man. I really wanted it to be real. Oh, well. Unfortunately, I have something real for you today. So mm, yeah. I wish I could say this wasn't real. That would be I fun. You know, you and me both, Christine. Cause I wish more of my stories were fake and more of yours were real. <laughs> remember that time you covered the Grinch? That was a fun day. That was a fun day. Uh, and I also didn't even day. get to appreciate it for half of it because I, I had to worry about it being real that whole time until I realized later, you know? Yeah. It's a bummer. Oh, well. But I'm glad I kept you in suspense. Um, okay, well, today um, I have a story for you that I thought I had covered for years. I've just been like, I had it checked off on my mental list. And then one day I did a little perusing and realized, wow, I literally have never covered this. And Ooh. I thought I had. This is a story of Ivan Malott and the Backpacker Murders. Yeah, no, I, that does not sound familiar. I don't know why. I was so thoroughly convinced. I checked like 10 times. But nope, I've never covered it. So today's the day. Cool. So the story is set in Australia. Um, I watched a show. I, I guess it was a show. It was like a two-part movie sort of on Amazon Prime called Fine. Catching Malat. And it's it's sort of a fictionalized or not. I don't know how the best way to put it. It's like a dramatized version. Like it's all acted out. It's not like a documentary. A reenactment? Yeah. It's like a reenactment, but it's like a full movie. And it's really well done. Um, and, and it sticks pretty close to the story from what I could tell. So that's a good movie to watch if you're interested in seeing the story kind of dramatized. So let's just get started. Okay. We are in Australia. Two hikers were walking through Australia's Belangolo State Forest at an area uh, called Executioner's Drop. Oh, well, there. Okay. Step <laughs> one start. is red, red flags already red there. Red flag number one. When <clears throat> one said to the other, come here and look at this kangaroo leg. Huh? <laughs> is that just what happens in Australia? Yeah. There's just like mangled kangaroo parts everywhere. <laughs> so the, there was one clip in this movie where one the guy goes, uh, 
oh, where were you? And he's like, out shooting. And he's like, oh, you catch a roo? And I was like, is this catch a roo? Oh my god, <laughs> catch a roo? Like I like I'm like not down with it, but the phrasing is something I catch a roo. It's great. Catch a roo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Let's so see if we can. Let's see if we can redo. We can like uh, come up with a different. It. Yeah, a different reason to to say something to like catch that. A so roo. it's so it's fun to say. Yeah, I agree. Um, so these two hikers are walking through Belangelo State Forest at Executioner's Drop, and one says to the other, come here and look at this kangaroo leg. So it was September 19th, 1992, and police had been called to the site to investigate. Near the kangaroo leg, they also found a patch of skin which had fur on it, and quickly realized that's not fur, it's hair. It's human hair. And it wasn't a kangaroo leg, it was a human elbow. Oh, what? So, Hang on. I feel like a human elbow and a kangaroo leg look very different. Oh, I understand. Like, not the meaty thigh part of the kangaroo. Like, we're talking, like, the foot and the Like his ankle. leg. Yeah. I know, but when I think of well, leg, I bones. think of, like, their, their large... The, their their oh, kickers. They're... Their kicker meat. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. No. I, I know that's <laughs> fucked up. But, like, the... Where, like, the kangaroo, like, when they jump and then they go, wah! And they, like, get you with their... Uh-huh. With their tushy muscles. Oh. I thought that part was also attached to... Oh, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what kangaroo bones look like. I can't even pretend like I know what they look like. Um, I'm understanding better now it, when I think of, like, more of a kangaroo ankle versus a kangaroo leg. That could be that, what, that, that definitely looks like a, like a human elbow. Okay. I'm gonna Keep going to trust you on that. I have no idea what kangaroo bones look like, but I believe you. Okay. Um, so they find this kangaroo leg, quote unquote, turns out the police show up and they're like, that's not a kangaroo leg. It is a human elbow. So, uh, they rush to the scene. Other pieces of a young woman's body are found nearby and only a hundred feet away from that first corpse. Police find a second body. Mm. So the bodies were soon identified to be 22 year old Joanne Walters and her friend, 21 year old Caroline Clark. And they were British hitchhikers who had gone missing earlier that year. Joanne was from Wales and Caroline was from Northumberland and they had met in Australia while both out backpacking and became okay. friends there. So Joanne and Caroline had grown close and ended up sharing a flat together in Sydney's Kings Cross district. And they had been last seen on Easter Saturday, April 18th of 1992 headed toward Kings Cross station, carrying sleeping bags and a tent with plans to hitchhike South. Okay. So when Joanne's parents, Ray and Jill Waters, didn't hear from their daughter, who would usually call home once a week, they started to get worried. Um, and her par- and Caroline's parents, Ian and Jacqueline, were not totally concerned about Caroline's whereabouts until she didn't call home for her dad's 58th birthday. And so both sets of parents started to get worried because they hadn't heard from their daughters in so long. So they all traveled to Australia to uh, try and find them, hoping maybe they were out in the outback with no access to a phone or they had mm. picked up some side job and hadn't gotten a chance to call home. They were just desperate that something sure. explained their absence. So the uh, one of the parents, it was Caroline's dad, Ian Clark commented, we never gave up hope. We dredged around thinking of every conceivable thing the girls could be doing where they couldn't get in touch. Going out as, now this is a phrase I learned, going out as Girl Fridays on a yacht or working on a homestead without a telephone. Do you know what a Girl Friday is? Is it like how Saturdays are for the boys? (laughs) But like Fridays are for the girls? What is it? I was like, I was like, what is that? I couldn't understand that sentence going out as Girl Fridays. It must, maybe it's a British thing, but... Girl a Friday, girl, I, it's like a girl's night. Like girls night out, GNO. No, it's not. Uh, oh. It's a girl Friday is a female helper, especially a junior office worker or a personal assistant to a business executive. Oh, so it's like a job. Like, uh, so oh. he was saying maybe they went out as Girl Fridays on a yacht. So like they maybe showed up oh. as like assistants or helpers. Um, not at all. If if this were a game of Who Wants to Be a Millionaire and. I had to guess out of four options what Girl Friday means. <laughs> that would have definitely been one I didn't even Even put if the on. fourth one is like humpback whale or something where they always <laughs> put like, like the least obvious answer. Yeah, I would have been like, that's funky enough. It could mean something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was surprised because I, I, it must be a phrase because I Googled it and it immediately came up. So I'm sure it's just like something I just didn't recognize. Oh, um, fun. And probably a lot of people are listening like, yeah, duh, but I'd never heard it before. So yeah. fun fact, if you didn't but, know. The more um, you know. It seems slightly derogatory to be a girl Friday, which just means you're like an assistant or a helper. But, you know, what yeah, are there boy Fridays? I assume or is that not. Maybe like girls only get Fridays and like there's like boy Thursdays, you know? Well, I thought Saturdays were for the boys or do they get Thursdays too? 
Oh, God, I don't know. That sounds like a They get lot. everything, huh? It sounds like the patriarchy is back at it. <laughs> so, <clears throat> obviously, they found the bodies September 19th. They were not on a yacht somewhere. Unfortunately, they had been found dead. And the families, obviously, were heartbroken. So, the investigation uh, and an autopsy revealed that the two women had been bound, stabbed, and shot. <gasps> and oh that their murderer God. had sexually assaulted them while chain-smoking during the event. Oh my Which god. Which is like so odd because they I guess they just found a bunch of cigarette butts at the site and determined That's... that it was all from the the perpetrator. Okay. And also <sighs> like that feels it feels personal if it's like you're going to get that like like tie them up like that but then also to stab well, them they're super personal. I guess but so, I I mean it, it, I guess it makes sense were that they were foreigners so I think at this like point, multiple it was like, stab wounds and shot wounds. Oh my god! Like, yeah, it's very, very brutal. The story, fuck, it's disturbing. Um, so unfortunately, that was how the two of them were found, and tragically, the murders of Caroline and Joanne launched the police into the home stretch of a case that they were trying to figure out, which was the murders by someone known as the Backpacker Killer. So these two, oh god, deaths were the final, like, final hurrah of. You know, they, they put the police in the final stretch of figuring out who this backpacker killer actually was. I guess that's good, but also, yeah, that I mean, like, there's, and also that means they weren't the only two people who died from this no, person. Like, there's a whole sorry. series of people you haven't even covered yet. Correct, Amundo. This was sort okay. of the 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 hook, you know, the entry point into. Well done, well done on the hook. <laughs> to, but geez, I kind of wish there wasn't more people that also yeah, deal with this. Don't I as well? Um, so the public was first made aware of the fact that Joanne and Caroline had been missing during an England versus Australia rugby, rugby match in June of 92. Uh, police had actually interrupted the broadcast to show the girls faces on screen in the hope that, uh, it, they would reach like a large number of people, um, uh -huh. which makes sense. You yeah, know, you that... would want it in a sporting event that a ton oh, of people if, are if watching. If I went missing, I would want my face on like blimps, like whatever, wherever it could, <laughs> wherever you could put me, I would want, I If totally I don't go it. missing, I would also like my face on a blimp if anyone's, okay, well, if anyone's offering. <laughs> I guess that's also, JK, JK. That's part of the Gemini flair there. It's like, <laughs> just at all, at all circumstances, just put. We don't put. need a reason. <laughs> <laughs> but when there is a reason, by the way, like we really need it. But so. then you better follow through. Yeah. Uh, so it was because of this huge amount of attention garnered by a missing re persons report of Joanne and Caroline that police began to connect other missing persons reports of foreign tourists in New South Wales to these current, uh, this current case. So there were two 19 year olds who had also disappeared at the end of 1989 and three German backpackers who disappeared in 1991. So for reasons unknown, it took a while for them to set up like an actual specialist task force. And I think one thing, at least to me, that is always striking is like how gigantic Australian wilderness is. Like, I feel like vast, vast. And and so it's I feel like it's hard to comprehend how like it sounds simple to be like, oh, well, these people went missing and these people went missing. They should have connected them. But in my head, I don't know. Part of it's like. They're several years apart in such a vast area. I don't know. Maybe I'm just looking at it. I from... know nothing about the Australian wilderness. I just assume it's pretty insane. I just it, like. It feels, feels large. <laughs> I feel like I'm very, I feel like I have no idea. Like even my version of how big I'm thinking it is in my head is actually not as big as it is. Yeah. And I think I listened to that. I really like the show Case File, which is hosted by, it's an Australian host. So he covers a lot of Australian cases and so many of them take place in the outback and you j just the way he describes it as like emptiness and so vast that you would never Ooh. even be able to cover every you know Jeez. mile of it is just so creepy. Um, so anyway, they finally started connecting like that there were multiple foreign tourists missing from the same area in Australia. And uh, a year went by, still nothing conclusive had turned up. And meanwhile, on the other side of the world, a young man named Paul Onions. Okay, well... <laughs> Sorry, I don't know which joke to make, an onions joke or the fact that it's so similar to Paul Bunyan, but... Okay, here's the thing. So you hadn't heard that name before, right? No! Okay, because it's like a running joke on my favorite murder, so like I knew all about Paul Onions before the story. Who the um, fuck is Paul... Wait, he's been in many stories? 
No, no, he's like from my favorite murder. Like they covered this and oh. talked about Paul Onions. And so it's become like a long standing joke there. So maybe that's why I thought I'd covered this before because I was maybe. like, oh, I know all about Paul Onions. <laughs> Paul but there's onions. like a joke on my favorite murder where like Karen and Paul Onions are like fall in love or something and like go off to get run away together. I don't know. I don't know the full story, but Paul Onions was very striking. I feel like if there was a Paul Mac and Cheese, I would totally fall in love with that <laughs> yeah. person. But yeah, Paul, Paul Onions, Onions is I don't know the about. the greatest name. Um, uh, he's never left my mindscape after hearing Apparently, about it. Apparently, <laughs> he was <laughs> burnt <favorite>. in. <laughs> burnt in. Yeah. So it's just fascinating. But so, yeah, I wanted to see if you'd heard that before. But Paul Onions is the best name ever. Uh, he lived in Birmingham, UK, and he had heard about the murders of Caroline and Joanne the Hitchhikers, and he was like, huh, this sounds really familiar to something traumatic that happened to me. Oh, dun, shit. Dun, dun. What happened to Paul Onions? So, Paul Onions had gone backpacking in Australia in 1990, and a man had offered him a ride. But when they turned into the Belangelo State Forest, the driver pulled a gun on him. <gasps> And robbed him, but he was able to escape the man. And um, they do like a really wild reenactment of this in the movie. I don't know how accurate it is to what happened, but basically, he was able to escape. And uh, according to the movie, he jumped in another family's car and was like, "Drive!" Oh my God, uh, Paul Onions! Like, okay, Paul so Onions. now now it's like Fast and Furious starring Paul Onions. Yeah, he's like, it. "I'm Mr. Onions. Step aside." Yeah. <laughs> so, Mr. I'm Onions. the big O you've been looking for. <laughs> Mr. O has stepped into the vehicle. He yeah. was able to escape the man and reported to the the experience to the police, but they never took any action on it. And uh, his uh, report, apparently, even though he had made it to the police, was lost. So they didn't even have the original report to connect it until he called and said, like, hey, remember me? This happened. And they were huh. like, we don't have a report. And he's like, well, I filed one. But so basically, he was like, strange, same location, same kind of MO, guy with a gun, kind mm -hmm. of description and yeah. he called in and said this sounds familiar so we're gonna leave mr onions here don't worry we'll be back leave him. him on the pantry shelf yeah <laughs> don't leave well yeah leave him in a pantry yeah right that's where you store onions yeah that's not a right. fridge not a not fridge, a fridge. No, no. No, no, no no never that's, a fridge that's, that's like paul apples paul peppers something no, you like don't that. put an apple in the fridge either do you i don't some people do some people you know do. what you know what rj puts in in the fridge right paul peanut butter and i'm like why do you put peanut butter in the fridge okay i started doing that and blaze was like can blaze literally had a talk with me like can we not put peanut butter in the fridge why would like, you put something that's so, supposed to be smooth and soft in the fridge to harden in, and then you can't when, use it because when i was little we would buy probably the reason why i think is because my mom would always buy the like super intense like organic whatever peanut butter so you'd like, like stir it yeah, and she would always keep it in the fridge, but maybe it was either a German thing, it was either the fact that it was weird organic peanut butter, I'm not sure, but now it suddenly hit me like, oh, you don't need to put that in the fridge, so now I don't keep it in the fridge, but I did for a while. You know what blows my mind is that, uh, and maybe you already knew this, I'm sure several others do, but in the US, we put like eggs in the fridge and you're not supposed to? Well, actually only if they're like fresh eggs from like a farm or, or oh. an actual, because like one of our family friends has chickens and he gave us a bunch of eggs. And my mom was like, do not put these in the fridge. They're not meant for the fridge. Whoa. Okay. But if you buy them at the grocery store, I think you're supposed to refrigerate them. Got it. I mean, I still do, but I, I I'm apparently pretty sure you are. If they're like pasteurized. Got it. Anyways. Yeah. Fun fact, but fun fact. I, <laughs> I, I paused for a moment because I was like, how far of a tangent are we going to go? <laughs> It's Pass food related. We could be gone for a long time. Well, <laughs> apparently in ASL, there's a like a, a pun that like only makes sense if you're speaking in ASL, but pasteurized milk, it, the way that it's signed is like the sign for like past your eyes. Wait, really? That's yeah. fun. I don't know what the actual uh, like hand movements are, but whatever past your eyes is, it's past your eyes milk. Oh, that's, and that's so cute. Pasteurized milk. Okay, anyway, sorry, Paul Onions or whatever we're doing with them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so Paul Onions is in the pantry. We're going to just gently close the door, leave him there for a little bit. Yeah. So a couple weeks after Caroline and Joanne had been discovered, on October 5th, 1993, Bruce Pryor, a man named Bruce Pryor, was searching for firewood out in the woods when he discovered a human thigh bone and a skull in the forest. Jesus. Yeah. So it would turn out to be a few kilometers away from where the bodies of Caroline and Joanne were found. So obviously police were called to the scene and they identified the remains as 19-year-old Phyllis Everest and James Gibson, a couple who had gone missing in 1989. 
So pathologists weren't able to conclusively determine the cause of death, but Phyllis had been stripped naked. Uh, Her bra and underwear were found cut with a knife. Mm. And it was also evident she had been gagged with her tights. Oh, my God. Yeah, it's really, really dark. Um, and James, what, what year was this again? Or so that what? Ha- they had gone missing in 1989, and the bodies were discovered in 1993. <gasps> so that whole time they've been missing? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, my so God. So a lot of this is taking place. A lot of this is like flashbacks to several years earlier. Oh, my God. Okay. So... Um, pathologists weren't able to da da they found out that um she had been gagged with her tights james body was lying in fetal position 50 meters away from phyllis's body he had been covered with sticks and branches and had been brutally stabbed like multiple times um pretty dark stuff uh by the time this examination of the bodies had been finished um in october of 93 superintendent clive small from the special task force was certain they were dealing with a serial killer because at this point, everything matched up a little too closely sure. to be coincidence. Yeah. So 20 detectives were assigned to the team. They had sniffer dogs that got involved. And then an extra 60 police officers were added to focus on the kind of like kilometer area where the bodies were found. Um, but according to the superintendent, the net is really Australia. We have something like 17 million people. We start from there and work in, which I'm like... It doesn't seem like a very productive way to get yeah. 17 million people inward, but, you know, I guess you have to rule people out. I don't know. So a couple of weeks into the investigation on November 1st of 93, the remains of 20-year-old German hitchhiker Simone Schmidl were also found, and they were found oh five kilometers away from Phyllis and James. Jesus. And from the discovery of her body, it was evident she had suffered multiple fatal stab wounds. And she had last been seen on January 20th of 1991 when she was looking to hitchhike from Sydney to Melbourne to reunite with her mother, which is like extra sad. That, yeah. Wow. Um, so uh, having found Simone, pe- police knew that there was a high chance they would find the other missing German hitchhikers who had been with her, which were 20 year old Anya Habschild and 21 year old Gabor Neugebauer. I don't know. Whoa. Say that again. Ga- Hang on. Gabor. And then his last name is Neugebauer or Neugebauer. Okay. Got it. I was, <laughs> like, also, I was impressed, but also Gabor afraid Neugebauer. I didn't hear it right. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah, a yeah. lot of syllables. Yeah, yeah. Um, so the other two, Anya and Gabor, were also had also gone missing with Simone. So once they found Simone's body, they were like, aha, oh. we have a feeling the other two will be around here as well. Got it. Okay. Jesus. Okay. Yeah. Wow. There's a lot of young folks disappearing here. And were they also, because Simone was like on her way to meet up with her mom or did we know what the uh, if they were also meeting up with their families so that's a good question they were all together because the families um had i think they were all to, i'm pretty sure they were all together um i don't totally know that's a really good question okay i don't want to say i don't want to guess just in case i'm wrong but in case there was any even more sad information to have to process so. yeah i'm not totally sure but um i do know anya and gabor they were a couple oh. uh yeah, I don't know so, why that makes it worse, but it just makes it. I don't know it just, why. Yeah, their it's parents just, had already been like, their parent Gabor's fa- parents had come to Germany, er, come to Australia to do like TV shows and try to put the word out. Um, oh my god! But so the two of them they knew would be together. So unfortunately, so both of their bodies were found a few days later, uh, one kilometer away from Simone's body. So they're all just cropping up all these bodies. Um, how many found. is that now? That's one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five. six. So the five? first two two young women, right? Um, then Phyllis and James, a couple. Uh huh. And then, then these three, Simone, and then yeah, the the two, uh, Anya wow. and uh, oh my Gabor. god. So that's seven now, and that, that <laughs> yeah, it's very frightening. Um, so they found the bodies of Anya and Gabor. And they found that Gabor had been gagged and he had been shot six times in the head. Oh, my God. And Anya had been decapitated with a sword or machete. Oh, my God. I know. Sorry. I know. Like, like what else am I supposed to say, though? Like, oh, my God. Yeah. And uh, they actually never found her head. <gasps> yeah. Oh, my God. I know. That's... It's really, really twisted. Ah. <sighs> Okay. Yeah. So, um, Dr. Peter Bradhurst, who is a forensic pathologist on the case, 
commented, uh, what immediately comes to mind when thinking about Anya's murder is the style of ceremonial execution. So even though, um, you know, a lot of these people had just been like stabbed and shot. Now they had this like really intense beheading as part of the murders. So it's just really. (sighs) So, I mean, I can't, I can't think of anything more fucked up, but like, so did that at least give them some sort of indication like because that feel that doesn't just feel like a oh i'm i have the urge to kill and i'm going to randomly kill this person that feels like there was a a strategy behind it so like did that give them any insight or was this person just like she was was like like, hey i haven't beheaded someone before living large jesus christ okay yeah it doesn't end up becoming any sort of significant part of my first thought was like throw that into like a profile of like okay so now we're using swords like what does that mean or a ritual or nope Nope. Wow. Just ended oh up God. being part of part of the sick. the random process. Um, it's very sick. So, so obviously, like this is becoming this is breaking out in the media. So they're getting call thousands of calls and tips, um, and none had been particularly useful until November fifth, when a man came to the police with suspicions about his coworker. So his coworker's name was Robert Ivan Marco Malat. And the man reporting him was suspicious of Ivan because he had this really strange obsession with guns and wouldn't stop talking about them. Uh And he just was like, something's weird about this guy. Like, he he just had a bad feeling. So he reported this guy to the police. So Robert Ivan Marco Malat, also known as Ivan Malat, was born December 27th, 1944. He was the fourth son of 14 kids to Stephen and Margaret Malat. I'm sorry, and, Stephen and Margaret Duggar, I think is what you meant. Duggar. To say. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> the Australian version of the right, Duggars. Right. Yeah. Um, Duggars. Yeah. <laughs> Duggars. Stephen, at the time of Ivan's birth, was uh, 44. Ooh, okay. And Margaret was 22. So Ooh, when Margaret okay. was 22, this was her fourth child, and then she would have 10 more. <laughs> so yikes. Girl. Oh, my Girl. God. Okay. Um, so Stephen, the dad, was known to be strict but fair. If you came home and you'd been in any sort of trouble, he'd whack you to the ground. So oh. Doesn't sound fair to me, but you know, whatever. I feel like that. I feel like that was their way of trying to make it seem sillier than it is. Like just yeah. whack you to the ground yeah, instead sort of, of like, like abuse me. Yeah. It, well, it's sort of like that phrase of like, "Well, I was hit as a kid, and yeah, only when I was bad and I deserved it." It's like, yeah, well, I only well, got I got smacked around every now and, and I, then. It's like and I'm fine. Uh, <laughs> okay. And I'm fine. My eyes yeah. twitching. And I'm no, fine. No, yeah. Nothing's wrong with me. I promise. Yeah. I'm fine. I just want to hit my kid. Yeah. Okay. I just, well. I'm just feeling extra <laughs> violent. Violent. So he, uh, when Ivan was four, his father pursued a career in market gardening and got the whole family into working on gardening, which sometimes involved them all being up until 2 a.m. watering the tomatoes. Um, It just seemed like a strange family life. I don't know. Um, But they were a big family crammed into a three bedroom house. Again, 14 (gasps) kids. I'm sorry. Yeah. But. To be fair, your childhood house housed like <laughs> thirteen children in three rooms. Yeah, sixteen children. Yeah, sixteen. Oh my god! So you, your house is a. If your house could hear a podcast and heard this exact sentence, they'd be, <laughs> it's like smoking a cigarette right now, being like, "I know that feeling." You know. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me see. One, two, three, four, five. But that house has seven bedrooms, so that I was. I thought you said all the kids were upstairs, though, in those three um, rooms. So the boys were. Yeah, that's true. The boys were all upstairs in the three bedrooms. Yeah, that's true. And that, how, how many boys were in that family of 16 13. children? So there you have it. 13 <laughs> kids in three rooms and nope, 14 totally kids in right. You're totally right. Woo. Um, but that, yeah, no, you're, to- you're completely right. Um, so, bananas so, either way. The fact that there's yeah, two not, examples of it's, this. Uh, it's unbelievable. I don't, I can't picture it. How many bunk beds does it take? To, uh, we'll oh have my to God, do the math later. They so many bunk beds. We had to like take them out. And they were oh so God. heavy because they were like from the 50s. So they were like full wood. <gasps> Made of like. American yeah. trees. solid wood, yeah, <laughs> literal trees, yeah, <laughs> made of sequoia, you know. <laughs> it was bananas, but yeah. So that's a really good point. So they all crammed into this three-bedroom uh, house in Liverpool, uh, and they. Oh, oh my God! I'm literally reading my next bullet. It says they have triple-tier bunk beds. They had literal triple-tier bunk. Oh beds. Oh my God! So. Really made of like <laughs> made, <laughs> made of made trees, <laughs> American trees, <laughs> made of American whatever trees. that fucking reads. <laughs> <laughs> um. So. The mother, Margaret, insisted that it wasn't tough raising all the kids because we worked hard and never had trouble with Ivan or none of them, really, which is like, well, good for you. 
However, yeah. one of the brothers, Boris, revealed about uh, Ivan once that, quote, he was going to kill somebody from the age of 10. Holy it was shit. built into him. He had a different psyche. He's a psychopath, and it just manifested itself with, I can do anything. Oh, my God. So, so they've known since the kid was, like, 10 that they yeah, had to worry about him. That there's At least this one brother said that. Um, the mom wow. was like, I never had any problems. But the brother was like, no, no. I would trust he the sibling. I feel like kids usually tell siblings more yeah, than Yeah, like parents. you see the darker side, I think, of your siblings than like yeah. if your dad's going to beat you, if you're bad, maybe right. you don't admit that to your parents. But right. yeah. So at age 15, like his older brothers, Ivan left school to work on various building sites to help earn money for the family. And it was then that Ivan really started to get in trouble with the law. So at age 17, he was arrested and sent to juvie for six months because of a breaking and entering incident. And then during the 60s, he went to jail four times for breaking and entering, stealing, and car theft. And there were only four incidents, only four incidents recorded, but it's believed that there are a lot more that just never got put on paper. Got it. Um, And apparently this is important because the family was so close, there was like an essentially unwritten rule in the family that they would never rat each other out. Oh. So it kind of adds a little bit of perspective to the whole case. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. So in 1971, the Malat family uh, had a tragedy in the family when Ivan's younger sister, youngest sister, Margaret, was killed in a car accident with her older brother, Wally. <gasps> um, and she was only 16 and it was a mile away from home. So it was like really, really Jeez. hard on everybody. And did, did Wally survive? Um, yes. Or, okay. So it was I just, believe Wally was survived and he was driving death, too, two. which is like, yikes. Wow. Poor Wally. I can't yeah. even imagine the guilt. Yeah. Extra, extra bad. Um, so a month after his sister's death, he was charged with raping a woman he had picked up hitchhiking near Liverpool. Oh, holy shit. Okay. Yeah. And around this time of the 1971 crimes, other backpackers had begun to go missing. Um, he was also faced with two, and these weren't connected to him yet, obviously. Like these were just incidents that were occurring while he was also getting in trouble for other things with the law. Um, And that year, he was also faced with two armed robbery charges, one of which was an actual bank that he had robbed. Oh. So he's not fucking around here. Yeah, that's not small potatoes. No. And he got bail, fled to New Zealand for two years, was arrested upon his return. And apparently, according to Crime and Investigation, he was acquitted of the robbery charges and in a one-day trial beat the rape charge after one of the victims changed her story. And uh, there was evidence that Malat, age 26, had tied up both women and threatened them with a knife. But incredibly, the police task force investigating the backpacker murders never learned about the chilling similarities of those crimes until much later. So (laughs) he's like, it's just so frustrating because it's like he's like like, he like was so close to getting caught a couple times. Yes. It reminds me of who's that guy with the shoes that I hated. The guy that kept getting. Oh, my God. The the story you kept telling it was a two parter and every time he like almost got oh, caught. Oh, Night Stalker, Richard Ramirez. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that one maybe was infuriating. <laughs> that one was pretty infuriating, but this definitely has tones of undertones yeah. of that of like, oh, so we were so close so many times and, and so many lives could have like, been saved. Yeah, and the connection wasn't made because like they didn't get they didn't realize the similarities until much later. That of like, course. wait, this guy's been in trouble for this almost exact same crime 20 years ago. Jeez. I think that would be like the hardest part for me for being a detective is like, if I found out if you missed something. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my, I couldn't live with the guilt. I mean, and the thing is like, he had been totally acquitted of those charges. So like, it wasn't even like he had served time for them or anything. So it wasn't like obvious. Um, so in 1975, it was thought that he had kind of changed his life around because he met his future wife, Karen, who was 17 at the time and pregnant, get this, with Ivan's cousin Mark's baby. <laughs> Hold on. Hang on. <laughs> I know. With, cous- Mar- with Ivan's cousin's baby. Yes. Okay. I'm yeah. there. So his cousin's baby mama <laughs> was so, now so his, his cousin wife. and him were sleeping with behind, the same one. Sleep- yeah, uh-huh, uh-huh. Mm-hmm, okay. mm-hmm. So he married Karen. And they got a caravan together. Ivan raised Karen's son, a.k.a. his cousin's son, Jason, like his own. And they got married a couple years in. But when Ivan started working for the Department of Maine Roads and had to leave for multiple days, sometimes weeks to work, the marriage collapsed. And Ivan began having an affair with his, okay, here we go, 
write this down on your tree. Uh, hang on, hang on. Okay. <laughs> so before we get there, you're the best at this. Like, so if anyone can figure it out, it's you. I love a good. I love drama. I love a good family tree. I was complex I relationships. Was, I was born ready for this with a good, you know, my small town Fredericksburg drama. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I can figure it out. Okay. Let's go. So Ivan began an affair with his brother Walter's first wife, Maureen. Oh, that's it? Yeah. So, oh, so okay. he's raising his... So his sister-in-law. Yeah, so his sister-in-law. He's raising his cousin's baby with his new wife as his own baby, but then he has an affair with his sister-in-law. Sounds um, right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. And Maureen. And it would later be revealed that his affair with Maureen would often be really violent, and Maureen called him oh. gun crazy. <gasps> uh, oh, Maureen, like, get out of there. Oh, Maureen, my God. watch oh. out. Gun crazy, not good. So Valentine's Day in 1987, Karen, the wife, packed up uh-huh. her belongings and officially left with the kid. And in 1989, Ivan quit his regular job and began working under fake names to evade taxes and to stop Ooh. Karen from demanding child support. Oh. Um, and... This is not a coincidence, but around the same time as his divorce went through in 1991, hitchhikers Deborah Everest and James Gibson disappeared. So it seems like anytime he's having like a big crisis. That tracks though, vanish. right? Like, yeah, that, tr- I think we've that seen tracks that. and that like, yeah. oh, when things are getting hard and you have like a bunch of, but they, they have like anger or energy they need to get out. It yep. leads to another crime. Yeah, exactly. Or like a control thing of like, you're losing control in your personal life. So you go out and play god with other people's lives bingo bango Ugh. so back to the investigation of 1993 when they're finding all these bodies um at this point the only facts police were sure of was that whoever the killer was they drove a car had knowledge of the forest remember uh ivan also worked for the road department like built the roads oh, so yeah that was okay. another thing that ended up being uh kind of a ding, ding, he ding. understood the roads and the the forest um, and lived in or around the southwestern region of Sydney. So there was also a pattern that they discovered in that the crimes would happen around the holidays, usually Christmas and Easter, huh. which is odd. See, I wonder if that's, I'm sure you're about to give me the answer, but just like throw in my, <laughs> my ignorant two cents. Well, you know how like, at least for you and me, the holiday is uh, with family. Are easy and happy and nothing ever goes wrong and nobody else. Yep. There have been a few times when I'm with my own family during Christmas where I'm like, I could kill someone right now. But <laughs> yeah. like, yeah, I, mean, I, I don't, think a lot of but people others are in that. Yeah, might, it's like, you know, you get, it's like high tension. Like, and if he's yeah, already, completely. if anything is already like so quick to like make him have to like express his energy in violence, yeah. like, chances are the holidays is a great time well, and to he do has that. 13 siblings so like imagine the in two gatherings. bedrooms can you imagine <laughs> oh my imagine god imagine the gatherings can't even imagine so either christmas or easter which is just yeah interesting pattern and because the victims were either shot or stabbed police also thought the killer was a hunter or interested in hunting aka hmm. maybe gun crazy just saying uh-huh. Uh-huh, uh-huh. so yeah. needing more leads on november 5th of 1993 the new south wales government offered the highest reward for information they had ever offered and i think there was and it was five hundred thousand dollars in Holy australian crap. currency which uh, in u.s dollars is 370k about 369k Whoa. so like a lot of money for that's answers a uh, lot of guacamole a lot of guacamole, (laughs) Uh, a lot of Australian guac uh, being offered. And I think part of it was that a lot of other countries, these are all foreign tourists, not all of them, but several foreign tourists going missing or foreign hikers, young folks going missing. So a lot of countries were warning people to stop tourism to Australia saying like, it's dangerous down there. Don't send your kids there. People are getting attacked, especially tourists. So please don't go. People. Right. And so I think there was kind of a a fear in Australia of like, oh my God, we're being pitched as this like really dangerous, horrible place for tourists to go. We need to (laughs) fix our image. Yada, yada. Yeah. Yeah. So they put this huge reward out for any information. Um, and information hotlines unsurprisingly went through the roof within the first day. They got 5,100 calls <gasps> leading to 2000 leads. I'm sorry, 10,000 leads, 2000 suspects. So, Still. or not suspects but people of interest, I guess, but yeah, 10,000 leads. Um, so as all of this information was coming out across the pond in the UK, remember Mr. Onions, he's been in the dark pantry. Oh, Mr. Onions, <laughs> who could forget? Yeah. He's just, <laughs> that man is nothing but layers. I'm nothing. ready. <laughs> What's he doing? So, 
Mr. Onions, he's now 27 years old and he saw this information on, on TV and got kind of triggered in this way of like, this sounds really familiar to some trauma basically i'm still processing from when i was uh, in australia right so he called the police and said uh he wanted to see if his experience could help uh with putting this serial killer mystery to bed once and for all so he called london's australian high commission and he was pretty directly or pretty immediately in direct contact with the task force told them everything he knew um and then they were like okay hang tight we'll keep you on the record and then just like left him alone for five months which is like I know they had a ton of calls, but it's so Five frustrating. Five months is a long time. <laughs> yeah, Five months like is a long, long time. time. <clears throat> so he's going back in the pantry. So just, back just the, wait. Also, yeah, is he in Australia or is he no, in No, he's London? in the UK. The UK. Okay. Yeah. So I was going to make some joke about him being Paul Bloomin' Onion from like Outback. <laughs> but whatever. I oh guess he's not God. over there, so it doesn't matter. Yeah, also, I'm was. aware before the Australians get mad, I know y'all don't have Bloomin' Onions <laughs> over there. Just... <laughs> I really want to just drive that home like I just want to make them mad and say no I'm not going to do no. that but <laughs> I no, love please a good don't be mad at steakhouse at <laughs> look I all I know about Australia is what Outback Steakhouse has to offer and I <laughs> love Outback Steakhouse therefore I think I love Australia that's the most American thinking I've ever yeah, thought in my life it's pretty sad uh I don't know too much about Australia except that we always wanted to go on tour and now we can barely like make our way to Indiana so I don't oh, the best we've got is Outback are you kidding yeah, me yeah that's oh the closest God. we can get <laughs> Um, anyway, so he is in the pantry for a minute again, mm -hmm, but we'll mm -hmm, get back mm -hmm. to him. So on November 16th, police completed their six week search of the area and held a minute silence for the victims. And in January of 1994, when senior constable Paul Gordon was going through records of travelers who had been attacked, he came across an acquittal for a man named Ivan Malott, who had raped two hitchhikers and oh, this yeah. record had not been around yet. So he's finally discovering this and going, oh, that's weird. This sounds a lot like the case we have now. Mm. Um, so even though he was acquitted of it, he's like, well, the fact that he was charged at all is suspicious. Right. So as more information came in, Ivan Malat was turning into the number one suspect, but they didn't have enough um, evidence yet. So the police launched a surveillance task force to keep an eye on Malat's movements and whereabouts. And creepily, at one point, they spotted Ivan <laughs> in his front window, staring back at police through binoculars as they oh like, watched my God. his house. Okay, Ooh. so hmm, something's Sketchy. a little fishy. Yep, fishy. So back to Paul Onions. He's back. Oh, um, thank God. He obviously had some info that was going to help break the case. In April of 1994, he spoke to Australian police and revealed everything that had happened to him back in January of 1990. So what he said was he had gotten a ride from this guy. His attacker drove a white four-wheel drive, called himself Bill, and had a mustache like Australian cricketer Merv Hughes. Okay. I don't know who that is, but apparently <laughs> it's, uh, it's a very noticeable mustache. Um, okay. He also said this guy was from a Yugoslav background, was divorced, and worked on the roads in town oh, okay so they're like Seems well that's clicking. ivan <laughs> like he, yeah. he is from a yugoslav family um he has a big mustache he drives that exact car and he worked on the road so pretty fitting sure so onions was flown out to australia on may 2nd to go through videos and photos of various people who could have been his attacker and out of a handful of images he identified ivan malat saying i remember the mustache Oh, so it was that big old mustache that got Yeah, him. like what mustache? What is this? Is it like neon or something? What's happening <laughs> with this mustache? Let me show you if I can show you. His, let me see if I can show you his mustache. Cause like it's got to be pretty memorable for people to be like, oh, yeah, that mustache. It's quite a stash it is what I'll tell you right now. Um, is it like the Pringles man or something? Is that like what kind of mustache <laughs> we're working with here? Or? Here, it's like a... Um, let me see if you can see that. Oh, that's a big boy mustache. Yeah, it's that's an intense a, mustache. I call that a motorcycle mustache. Yeah, yeah, like the kind of... Yeah. Are those mutton chops? What are mutton chops? I don't no, know. No, mutton chops are the are the sideburns that like become like that go all like, the way. They're like very large and in charge okay, sideburns. Okay. Yeah, so he has just like the big old like wow. Yeah. The bike the biker the biker stash. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So he's like, I remember the mustache. Mm -hmm. And that's how he was like, that's definitely the guy. So it is a very it's not to like keep like honing on this, but it is like a really it's a statement piece on your face. Like, if you want to get away with shit, like, shouldn't you try You'd to blend so. in? You know? You'd think so. But um, 
he is kind of he's been getting away with it for a long time so all right you know fair enough who knows um but yeah no i agree it's definitely memorable um so on may 21st three detectives interviewed ivan's brother alex and alex's wife joan who according to murderpedia handed the police a backpack that apparently ivan had given to her saying it belonged to a friend who had returned to new zealand and didn't need it anymore so oh, that's fishy. Okay. Fishy as hell. So uh, subsequent tests showed it had once belonged to missing German backpacker Simone Schmidt. <gasps> so police were also alerted when Joan apparently made some unsolicited comments about serial killers keeping trophies from their victims. So basically after Paul Onions pointed him out in the lineup of photos and then Joan was like, he gave me this backpack. And then DNA was like, that's definitely Simone's backpack. Uh, they were like well this has got to be ivan uh so at 6 36 on a.m on sunday may 22nd police arrived at ivan's home and called him ordering him to come outside with his hands in the air but ivan thought it was a prank call (laughs) (gasps) oh my god are you serious yeah so he didn't come out and they were like uh (laughs) It's like, um, buddy, your refrigerator isn't running. Like yeah. we, like we gotta <laughs> yeah. get come outside immediately. It's so awkward because it's like, buddy, you know, you murdered a bunch of people. And like you think also, this is a like, prank call? If, it's pretty ballsy. Yeah, like also, I was gonna say, if I've already done something like that, maybe we're different people. But I would have such unimaginable oh. guilt that if, uh-huh. like. No way am I Someone could look at me sideways and I'd go, you're right. Put my hands up, you know? Like, I would be like, yep, they got me. I'd be like, you got me. You got me. That's that's 100%. I could shoplift a piece of gum and be like, okay, you're right. The police are on to me. (laughs) Oh, my God, I know. And so this guy's like, oh, it's a prank call, so he doesn't come out. So they had to call him three times before he finally left the house. And what they say the third time, like... My guy, this is not a prank You're call. never going to guess who this is. <laughs> it's like, apparently, we thought you'd guess by now, but it doesn't yeah. seem like you're going to figure we it out. You, we didn't think you were bright, but we thought you were brighter than this. Um, yeah. So they finally called him a third time, and he exited the house with his then-girlfriend, Charlinder Hughes. And after hours of interrogation, he was officially charged with the murders of seven backpackers and the attempted abduction of Paul Onions, how dare you, uh-huh. on May 31st. So... He denied all of the charges, even though police literally found 38 22 cartridges in a tin, electrical tape similar to that at the murder scenes, a Bowie knife, a 32 Browning pistol, and a map of the Belangelo State Forest literally in his house. What a dummy. Like, I mean, also, like, for him to just be like, nah, it's not me. Like, I know what you think it is, but it's not me. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. Like, it's, it's, it's very ballsy to be like, very ballsy. Me? No. Got the yeah, yeah, you you are on another planet, you my friends, idiots. with your puzzle <laughs> creations. I just yeah. love guns. That's all. Oh, right. Yeah. Um, and it was only a matter of time until police discovered Simone's water bottle and tent at his house, uh, including and also Deborah Everest's sleeping bag, Carolyn Clark's Olympus camera, foreign coins that belonged to the backpackers, and a picture of Ivan's girlfriend wearing a green and white Benetton top that had belonged to Caroline Clark. That'll do it. Yikes. All in his house. So that'll do it. His girlfriend's literally wearing a shirt that he took off of one of these women that he murdered, which is like, oh, my God, to find that out later. It must be horrifying. Oh, yeah, truly. I didn't even think about what she would be going through. Like, of oh, so what? Where did this clothing come from again? Yeah, it's my favorite top. Right. Exactly. Oh, my God. So haunted. Yikes. So to top this all off, they also found a pillowcase containing Caroline Clark's DNA in his garage. I mean, it's like just so obvious. He has literal trophies from every single one of them in his house with their DNA on it. Like, there's no question here. Um, right. This is like, this is a, a the nail in the coffin. Nail in the coffin, you <laughs> yeah. think. So more evidence was found in, weirdly enough, the his siblings' houses. So he had plenty of siblings to, to hide shit at <laughs> right he had literally a baker's dozen of siblings <laughs> yeah, a literal of like, baker's dozen it's like you oh have this God. you have this you have this but also like if you know that someone like you have to hide it like maybe you just shouldn't fucking have it yeah you'd think so right but i guess maybe that's the psyche the whole psychological thing of trophies like i guess it's so. part of the risk and reward i don't know whatever it seems like <laughs> whatever a bigger hassle than it should be i would it's agree like, with you if i have to live in fear that also like 13 people in one way that sounds like a perk for the murderer of like oh 13 places to house this yeah. trophy but also that's 13 people you got to keep track of and like yes. what they're doing with your stuff well and that's why i mentioned earlier too like that um they're that really loyal really tight-knit family and so 
is kind of gets shady because it's confusing like was anybody else involved did anybody else know about this but yeah Mm -hmm. so he it's it seems like a a handful let's just put it that way a baker's dozen handful of people to to keep track of but so at richard's house ivan had hidden caroline clark's tent and bedroll at walter's house he had hidden the rifle that he had used to murder anya and uh anya habsheed at Alex's house, he had hidden Simone's backpack, and at their mom's house, police had found one of Simone's t-shirt and a t-shirt that had belonged to Paul Onions, like oh, God. Hidden, hidden in her home. So you're right; like this must just this must just be a trophy thing, because why else would you keep Paul Onions' t-shirt? Like, I mean, I know we say it every single time, but like, it's just further proof that he like could not be cockier of like yeah. I could just spread all of this evidence as far as i fucking want yeah. and no one's gonna find and i out. can watch my girlfriend put on this t-shirt knowing that i murdered also, the person who wore it that's extra insane like i like it makes me wonder if because the shirt belonged to simone um this shirt belonged to caroline it makes me wonder like was caroline his favorite well i don't know he kept t-shirts person? of all of them maybe this is just the one that he well like the one that he gave his girlfriend i imagine yeah. he knows that he he wants to see that most often maybe. instead of like hiding it in his like brother's shed or something like i don't this know one, that one feels gross like he's almost yeah, having like on them display role play or something yeah. it feels oh it's my like God. when you hear about murderers giving like their significant other jewelry or something that they've yeah. taken off bodies and it's like it's on display it makes it so much sicker <sighs> okay yeah. they can like That's see awful. their trophies in action yeah it's really gross mm. so although it's pretty fucking obvious at least to us that uh this guy is the one um right, they yeah. had no hard evidence that placed him in the forest at the time of the deaths which is like okay but like you it's like it, he has i feel t-shirt. like that's not needed now yeah I've, i feel like at this point we can skip that step <laughs> you can just like like check that one off anyway you yeah know? you'd think so um so strangely according to murderpedia alex malat one of his brothers told police as the second group of bodies was being discovered that in Easter of 1992, now this is just weird and I can't fully wrap my head around this. He says in Easter of 1992, he was driving past the Belangelo State Forest on a dirt road. He had seen two cars and in the back seats of these cars, he saw two girls tied up and gagged in the back seats. And police were like incredulous at this because he's giving detailed descriptions of what the men looked like, what the girls looked like, uh, the guns they had. Although he was saying he just passed them on the road. And okay. first part, they're like, this is really specific information for like just driving past. Second for a all, quick glance. For yeah. a quick glance. And second of all, if you saw two girls back gagged in the backseat of Why cars. Why the hell didn't you call the police yeah. or like stop and help or something? Yeah. And so and so that was just really odd. And uh, the friend that he was with in the car could only partly verify the story. The guy he was with was like, well, yeah, I saw two cars, but I didn't like see anybody in them i didn't see that detailed of yeah. a murder and in, in the moment and the other yeah. guy didn't say anything so it's like it's just a really weird tip um so nobody knows if he's just trying to get a reward but also like it just doesn't really make sense especially because hmm. it's ivan's brother so it's like does he know something is he right making up a story like i don't totally get it um but investigators discovered later that so he had these license plate numbers from memory and they matched part of the registration of ivan's car one of ivan's cars so okay he was like oh i saw one of the license plates it said like a c l blah 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 and it turns out that was like one of his brother's old cars so okay either he's either he actually saw something and like just never said anything never noticed it was his brother's car or he like knew something and was trying to like give them an backhanded tip uh, like, like give them a know. give them a nudge without breaking loyalty yeah, yes exactly that's my guess i don't know but that it's just weird but um he, nobody knows if he was like maybe trying to confuse police and like send them in the other direction or right yeah if, if it was like a kind of roundabout tip off to, to this day he maintains he told the complete truth about what he saw and he has no other information so okay. nobody really knows but i just thought that was so strange i was like it's not a coincidence that your brother would be reporting this to the police. Right. And it ended up being your brother. I just found that so odd. So I don't really know what that means, except that it, it again, goes back to like the siblings were so close and they had this bond to not rat each other out. So I don't I guess, know if those yeah. are related, but interesting. Interesting yeah. note. So 
During this time, it was also revealed that in 1974, when Ivan was awaiting his rape trial, he had confessed to a fellow prisoner named Noel Manning that in April of 1971, he picked up two 18-year-old girls who wanted to get to Melbourne from Liverpool. They had fallen asleep in the car, and then they had woken up with the sight of Malat pointing knives at them, telling them he was going to have sex with them, and then followed by, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to kill you. You won't scream when I cut your throats, will you? <gasps> oh, my God. Oh, my God. I don't know how to... I don't... Okay. I don't know what... I don't know. I don't... I would not... I would freeze, obviously. I'm freezing yep. now at the thought of it. It's beyond comprehension. He raped one of the young women, uh, and then both of them, thank Christ, were able to escape when he pulled into a gas station. But so, with this knowledge, police dug into even more unsolved race, rape cases because clearly, even though he had murdered seven people, like, there were people who had gotten away, like Paul Onions and this these yeah. two girls, two young women. So, they tried to go through unresolved rape cases to see if maybe the, the attacker had fit Ivan's description and they could tack more cases to him. Um, and it turns out that in 1984, two young women hitchhiking down the Hume Highway were picked up and taken to Belangelo Forest, and a man they later identified as Ivan Malat had said to them, okay, girls, which one of you wants to go first? <gasps> I know, it's chilling. Oh, my God. Yeah, it's sick. Um, and thankfully, these young women managed to escape as well, and they hid in the forest. And the the reenactment of this in that movie is so terrifying, where they're, like, in the woods hiding. It, I mean, terrifying. I don't know. Maybe I'm going soft, but, like, holy shit, I was freaking out. Um, oh my God. so they were able to escape and hide in the forest while Ivan tried to hunt them down and, uh, rather on brand for him, police discovered that the date of this attack, uh, or potential attack coincided with one of Ivan's breakups with Karen. So uh, clearly okay. he's going through some personal so shit, taking it out on taking mm, it out. Yep. Other yep. people. So we're almost to the end here. Ivan's trial at Campbelltown local court in Sydney began in October of 94 in what would be a particularly harrowing and gruesome trial because the evidence was just like so insane. Gnarly. Yeah. yeah. And like just stacking up on itself. Um, Ivan's ex-wife, Karen and Paul Onions were amongst those to take the stand and give evidence against Ivan. But when Ivan took the stand, he claimed he had never been to the Belangelo State Forest and had no clue how any of the victim's belongings ended up in his and his family members' homes. <clears throat> Which is like, okay, really? well, I don't really care for anything he says at this I point. I don't care so. for it either. This yeah. is what the judge said, which, like, cracks me up. The judge replied, You ask the jury to accept that someone broke into your locked house, despite the burglar alarm, planted a Ruger rifle bolt in the ceiling of your garage, dropped the weapons receiver in one of your boots in the hall cupboard, making sure both gun parts were painted in the same camouflage colors you use on your firearms, then left a single fired cartridge linked to the murder of Miss Caroline Clark in a plastic bag on the bed in a spare room, to which Ivan responded, they must have. <laughs> oh my God. Okay. Well. So he really is just sticking to his guns for lack of a better word. Just like blind faith Blindly that something trying to get will people. get him off. Yeah. Like just blind confidence that this is going to work. Um, so the prosecution's main line of argument was that while there can be absolutely no doubt that whoever committed all eight offenses must be within Ivan's family, the Malat family, or very, very closely associated with, if there was any doubt that Ivan was the guilty party, he should be given the benefit of the doubt. So his own <laughs> defense was like, yes, yes, it's very obvious someone in the Malat family is involved, but we can't be 100% sure it's Ivan. Okay. Which I guess is the safest way to go about this, because like, obviously... One like of you them don't have to it. be a hundred percent. You can be ninety nine point ninety nine percent sure. Like you know, not in a court. Not if you if you have any room for innocence. Ugh, you know. Whatever. Yeah. I, this so, is why I don't work in the legal world. Oh, this is why. This is why. <laughs> this, this is the is only reason. The only one. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> because I'd be like horse shit. We both know what's going on he over did here. did it. Yeah. <clears throat> um. So, however, on January, I'm sorry, July 27th, 1996, after a four-month trial and 20 hours of deliberation, the foreman read out guilty verdicts to all charges. They found Ivan guilty of all charges. Good. Um, and there are some theories, actually, that Ivan did not act <clears throat> alone, which is why I wonder about that one brother kind of saying that weird story to police about oh. seeing all those people. I don't know. But some people do think that he had somebody helping him. Um, for example... 
uh, Gabor's dad Mm -hmm. remains convinced that Malat was not alone, saying Gabor was six foot one inches tall or 1.86 meters and very strong. When we sometimes went to the forest to cut firewood, he would cut huge logs and carry whole stumps. It would have taken two men to kill him. So some people are like fully convinced that um, he didn't act alone or that at least maybe his siblings knew more than they let on. I mean, if um, he was being violent to strangers, I'm sure he was threatening his siblings or could have, you know. He could have. Like, or you have if, to help or. Or if one of his brothers knew from age 10 that his brother was a psychopath, like, yeah. you know, they clearly knew more than you'd think, than you'd hope. Um, yeah, so that's a good point. Ivan was moved into a cell in Maitland Bay, north of Sydney, where he was classified in his, as an A2 maximum security inmate. He is known as one of Australia's most terrifying serial killers. And two years ago, at 4.07 a.m. on October 27, 2019, the 74-year-old succumbed to esophageal cancer and passed away. And that is the story of Ivan Malat, the backpacker murderer. Whoa. Woof. So I decided that the way we should end this Uh is because (laughs) our only frame of reference for Australia is Outback Steakhouse, that we should educate ourselves on Australia a little bit. Okay, great. Um, just to get the bad well, taste of a murderer I, out of our mouth. I still remember the first thing we talked about Australia in like a very early episode about goon. Do you remember that? Yeah. Okay. So I'll skip that one. <laughs> Do you remember that? <laughs> I remember you being very excited about it. Very excited about it. Okay. So here are just some random little things to, you know, cleanse our palate after that kind Great. of story. Here are fun facts about Australia. If you visit one new beach in Australia every day, it would take you 27 years to see Oh, my them all. God. Oh, my God. Here's another one, something I hate and a reason why I actually don't like Australia. Each year, Brisbane, 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 Brisbane. each year, Brisbane hosts the World Championships of Cockroach Racing. <gasps> what the fuck? It's a fun fact that is not very fun. <laughs> Uh, our favorite kind of fun fact. Our favorite kind. Australia has three times more sheep than people. Oh, my God. But that's what I'm saying. They're just like a massive. And they have 17 million people. So, like, insane. it's a lot of sheep. Uh, let's see. Uh, Australia is the second country in the world to give women the right to vote in 1902. Thank you, Australia. I did remember that from uh, they did this on uh, my dad wrote a porno. They did an Australia episode where they. And they were trying to figure out what goon was, and I was, like, yeah. cracking up because they couldn't, like, figure it out. And I was like, I'll tell you. <laughs> um, well, uh, this one you'll like, Christine. There okay. are 60 designated wine regions in Australia. Oh, I like that. Producing approximately 1.35 trillion bottles of wine each Holy year. Holy mother of God, that's a lot of wine. There's also, God. Australia is the home to the longest fence in the world, which was meant to keep dingoes away from fertile land. And the oh, fence wow. is over 5,600 kilometers long. Wowza. Uh, and then also I found some animal ones also, some an- animal uh, facts, which I think I are about. By the way, that was, that was from makemytrip.com. Okay. And these are experienceoz.com.au, the animal okay. facts. All right. Uh, let's see. Wombat poop is shaped like a cube. What? Tasmanian devils have the strongest bite per body size of any <gasps> mammal. Oh, my God. This is, I tell you, Australia is a scary place. <laughs> Ooh, here's a fun one. Australia has a larger population of camels than Egypt. Really? Interesting. Fun fact, the record jump recorded by a kangaroo is nine meters, a.k.a. 30 feet in a single leap. Holy Goodbye. crap. That thing would kick my ass. I told you they got those mu- the tushy muscles oh, that push them. That's what I'm saying. It was a bone, though, not a muscle, you know. Uh-huh. Yeah, bone. yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the poop one freaks me out, too. The um, That wombat poop is shaped like a That's, cube. How, I don't understand that. How, what does your butthole look like to be able to push I that out? grasp what that would mean. Yeah. Um, the Australian emu can run <laughs> almost 30 miles an hour, which is 45 kilometers an hour. Dear God. See ya. Uh, look, and also 17 of the world's most poisonous snakes are in Australia. It's home to 1,500 types of spiders. I mean, are you fucking kidding me? And then me? all these serial killers. Like, oh my God, a scary the place. Platypus, they are highly poisonous and have enough poison to kill a dog or make a human seriously ill. Actually, you know what? I'm back to not wanting to go back to Australia. Um, <laughs> I love another- you, Australia. 
Here's another, the, uh, the one I'll end on is one that you and I can both relate to right okay. now. Koalas sleep about 20 hours per day. That I can get behind. That I'm, I'm down with. I'm feeling yeah. the koala life style. Anyway, I hope that that cleansed the pout a little bit about the things we do like about Don't Australia. Don't they also so. carry STDs, koalas? Maybe. I also know that they're like not actually as cuddly and sweet as you think Yeah, they are. I think you're they're supposed like, to be more careful around them. There's a picture, like if you look up like what an angry koala bear looks like, it is Oh, shocking. God. It is Yeah, they shocking. carry uh, chlamydia. So, oh, fun fact. Lydia chlamydia. Um, <laughs> angry koala. Oh, yeah. Just, <laughs> koala? I mean, just google angry koala let me send you my favorite picture of an angry okay. koala and then um okay you uh, we'll put this on our instagram also because after this is all just... the like travel time travel photos just an angry koala so if you haven't listened to the end of the episode you just won't get the joke here christine you tell me what you think about okay. snuggling this little baby holy why would you send me that that looks like a fucking horror movie oh uh, is that God, real any- it's real. Why is it all wet? I'd be angry too. Well, okay, maybe that's why it's mad. But <laughs> someone dumped something on him. Um, anyway, there's all that. Well, can I tell you before? Since we only have a couple of weeks left of this game, what size my baby is this week? Yeah. What was the last thing I told you? Was it Buzz Lightyear? Uh, Buzz Lightyear. Did I tell you Winnie the Pooh's jar of honey yet? Yes. Okay, so then this week it's Princess Buttercup's crown in the Princess Bride. <gasps> so that's fun. That is fun. That's and uh, also like a speak and spell. Oh, I do love See a good that? speak and spell. Yeah. You so. know, I always, they always freak me out because they sounded like demons. The uh, speak like and spell, the, yeah, they're scary. Oh, I mean, yeah. it's kind of like a Teddy Ruxpin, like, things shouldn't was, be talking. It was like the original um, Microsoft Sam. Yes, robotic like, voice. Hello. Like, Ooh. Your baby has teeth. <laughs> hello. <laughs> Fresh. Your baby is the size of Princess Buttercup's <laughs> crown. <laughs> also, another pointy object. So another pointy Just object. Oh, your kid's gonna. I think that's. Uh, it's hinting that your child's gonna have an sharp. affinity for sharp objects. Sharp so look gray. out. <laughs> <sighs> well, anyway, thank you everyone for listening, and uh, I guess that's. Is that it? Have Are sweet we good? dreams. We'll sweet see you next dreams. week. <laughs> and that's. Why we drink with Paul Onions. Oh, I miss him. <laughs>